Uh, guys, I'm uh, really looking forward to the meeting today. I don't know most of you, uh, so I'd like to get to know you during the meeting today. I thought uh, the best way to do that is if I um, just talk uh, and just do some stories rather than uh, put a PowerPoint slide up. So you'll be pleased to know we're not going through any uh, slides for my bit. Um, I wanted to go through three things today. Just one is uh, how we started. Um, what we've learned along, two is how we learned along the way, and uh, three, what, particular, what we're trying to do uh, for you in the next 12 months uh, as you're working with all your patients and all your colleagues. Um, so, so my, my name is Mohammed. I'm the CEO of Patients Never Best, and my background is as a, a physician programmer, and um, I, I love healthcare IT. Uh, but where I started this is 2007. Uh, I was speaking to uh, a doctor called Jim Jurgis in Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee. I was writing a book about how to give medical records to patients. This was what my customers had wanted in US hospitals. And Jim told me about a patient he'd seen with uh, chest pain. So the uh, doctor thought that the patient had aortic dissection, uh, a tear in the largest artery uh, in the chest, and he sent him for a chest C uh, CT scan. Um, now, he's very busy, as you can imagine, uh, and when the report came back, uh, the first line said, uh, there's no evidence of aortic dissection, so the gym was happy that the patient was safe, and, and he moved on to the next patient in his list. Um, but Jim told me that month he was experimenting with giving patients access to their medical record, and that patient emailed him saying, what is a thyroid? And... Jim said, well, why are you asking what a thyroid is? And he said, well, the last line on the radiology report says there's shadowing on the thyroid. Um, and that's when Jim realized that the radiologist was warning him about there being, um, although he was looking at the chest for the artery, um, the radiologist had also spotted in the throat, the thyroid had shadowing, which meant cancer. And so uh, he brought in the patient. It was spotted early, uh, biopsy, uh, and excise and the patient was fine. Um, now, Jim wasn't unusual in making mistakes. He's a human being, so of course he makes mistakes. But he was unusual in how he reacted to that. So what he did from that day was to say to all his patients, uh, I need you to look at the information with you, with me. Um, we're on the same team. We all need to look at this uh, with the information that we have and get the best, safest care for that patient. Um, and, and I thought of that... Um, for myself, so I have uh, a rare disease. Um, uh, I mean, to, to, to give you an example, so my, my GP came to my wedding. Um, she cried because no one expected me to have made it for that long. Um, so because when I was growing up um, until the age of 10, half the year I was off school. Um, but then my doctors in Great Ormond Street Hospital diagnosed me and they were able to give me treatment that meant I could go to school. Um, once every three weeks, uh, I would spend a whole day in hospital getting infusions. And then when I became 16, um, a nurse came to me called Helen, um, and she asked to teach me uh, how to inject myself. Uh, and so as a 16-year-old, I had to balance two things. Uh, one is uh, fear of needles, um, which is quite embarrassing for um, going to medical school. And the other hand is uh, fear of uh, looking like a wimp in front of a young woman. So... I said, fine, uh, go ahead. And she taught me how to inject myself. Um, and so that changed from um, them saving my life to them giving me a life. So I could uh, travel, I could study, uh, get married, have a family. Um, so my doctors had always trained me to be uh, independent and give me that. And so as he was telling me that story about his patient, um, I realized that the other half of it was that I had to do things for my team. And the more information I was given, the more useful I could be for my medical team. And so I spent a, about a year trying to understand this problem and solution better in the USA. And I decided I really wanted as many people to have uh, access to this as quickly as possible. Uh, and the right place to do it was the, the UK with the National Health Service, not the USA. Um, so I came back in 2008 and I quickly learned why it was urgent and important. Uh, so 2008, financial crisis had just happened. Austerity was just beginning. And all these lectures I turned up to, uh, there were senior people in the NHS saying, um, how are we going to explain to the public that it's no longer affordable to have universal coverage? How will we tell everyone? 
uh, that, that's when I knew it was urgent. So they were correct that continuing in the old way was not affordable, but they were wrong in thinking there was no way, no new way that was affordable. Um, and, and that's what we wanted to, to make happen. Uh, and the other side was the importance. So I went to my doctor and I said to him, um, you know, I, I'd like to do this. I'd like to give patients their medical records. And he said to me, I remember this is the doctor who um, had spent years getting me independent. Um, one of the most progressive people I've ever met. He says to me, I'm not sure I can give you your test results because of the Data Protection Act. And I realized uh, that um, all these people who are trying to do the right thing, like my doctor, uh, didn't do, know how to do it right. Uh, and so that would be our job. So for him, it would be the first, probably the last time that he does that, um, working digitally online with patients. Uh, but for us, that's what we would do every day. And we would go through everything that was required, all the many things that had to be unblocked for someone like my doctor to do that. So the legal side, the commercial side, the clinical side, the operational side, all these things had to be worked out. So uh, we spent several years trying to get this right. I mean, it began with um, Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, a lady called Susan. Uh, she had 35 children she was looking after in 35 cities. And for each of those children, the person who most knew about the child's health and what they needed uh, was the mum. Uh, but when they went to A&E, they would often not listen to her and wait until a fax had come back from Great Ormond Street Hospital. And so what Susan wanted to do was to give the information to the family that with the logo from Great Ormond Street, so that child gets the right care as quickly as possible. And she spent a few years doing that. And then one of the children became 18 and she went to St. Mark's Hospital and that doctor saw all the data from Great Ormond Street immediately, including information that was never in any medical record. All the messages back and forth between Susan and the mum uh, explaining exactly how to look after that child. Uh, so we carried on with that, uh, proving that the data with the patient is the right thing. And then in 2015, Northwest London said, can this be done for everyone? Uh, and they were the first region, first population to do that at scale, uh, with 16 hospitals, 400 GP surgeries. Uh, and they proved that um, you need to do this for all the patients. When they started off the first three years, only 3,000 patients were registered. Uh, usually every clinician would hesitate uh, in the beginning, is this patient um, too unwell uh, to be able to log in? Uh, are they too poor to have a computer? Uh, do they not understand how to do this? So they only registered 3,000. So then they offered it to everyone in the hospital in kiosks when they came into the clinics. And in one month, 3,000 more patients registered, more than the previous three years. Uh, and so that's when they showed that you have to give this to all the patients um, because all kinds of them are, are interested. And what was really interesting is that the patients were interested in the data. So about 25% of patients who came to the clinics were registering, but 95% of those with the test results were registering. So if they had something they really wanted, they were motivated uh, to, to log in and, and look at the data. Uh, and if you look at the, um, every now and then I go to Trustpilot and look at our, uh, our reviews. So we have uh, one to five, if any of you use uh, Trustpilot. So, uh, the patients that have that give one, um, about 35% of them are basically complaining they haven't had their test results. And the patients that give five uh, top marks, they basically say, I love it, I get my test results. And, and to give you uh, an example, um, my colleague Katie, she's not on the call today, she's on leave. Uh, she lives in um, a kind of street that has street parties. Uh, so last month she was at a party and uh, this woman, she met this woman and she was telling her about uh, her recent diagnosis of cancer and that she was being treated in London and before um, and she had this thing called care information exchange and before Katie could tell her that she works for the company that does that um, the woman began logging in and showing Katie all of her test results uh, Katie's a nurse and she wanted her um, just just to show her what, what what's in there um, and as Katie was telling her you can click this and do that the woman said how do you know so I'm from patients know best and the, the woman gave Katie a hug. Uh, she said, I can't tell you how much it's helped uh, to just have all my information uh, before the appointment. It's such a stressful period of my life. Uh, it's so important that I have it, that I prepare for my appointment. I'm with my uh, family when I get the news and I know what to do after the appointment. 
And the last thing that will end is we uh, need to make it convenient, uh, especially with COVID. So uh, we went live uh, with the NHS app in March, just as the lockdowns uh, last year, just as the lockdowns began. Uh, and it was part of everyone's COVID response that the patient should have the data. And what the COVID lockdowns uh, taught everyone in the UK was the importance of digital. You know, we all learned how to shop online. Uh, but also the COVID lockdowns got everyone to use the NHS app to have their passports, uh, to have something that goes with them. Uh, so our integration with that made it really convenient uh, for the patients to have all their information. Um, but we also expanded it so it works in the individual clinical teams that are specific to that patient. So we're about to go live right now with the 70 hospitals offering kidney dialysis services across all four nations. And so combining the NSH, NHS app to look at your general record, but then your local clinical team with giving you that kidney dialysis information is really powerful and convenient for the patient. So I want to finish in the last five minutes um, on what we want to do to, to help you. So as you're doing the right thing every day, uh, we want to help you do it right. Um, so the three things are we're focusing on um, the aspect of giving this to all the patients and so making it as easy as possible uh, to register as many patients as possible. The NHS app is terrific for doing that because uh, patients just passively come across the, um, the functionality in the NHS app. They register, they onboard, they take care of themselves with minimal impact on their clinical team. Uh, but we also have the token-based registration um, and uh, that means you specifically target patients who have a healthcare event. They're, they're highly motivated to log in. And we want to make that uh, continue making that easier and easier uh, in terms of the onboarding process. Um, the second thing is to make it as usable as possible. So once they log in, uh, to make it as attractive and easy to understand to navigate all the data that's in there, but also as uh, easy as possible to add information because they know things that aren't in your record and that's useful for you as well as useful for them when they come to their emergency department. Uh, and the last thing is to make it as easy as possible to give as much data as possible. So uh, we've always given you um, HL7 APIs, uh, but we're migrating everything so that you have fire APIs and we're making them read write so that anything in the record is also available back to you from your um, local medical records, local shared care records, because uh, we have data that's not there, whether it's from the patient or from devices or from other regions also looking after the patient. Uh, so that, those are the three things that we're focusing on this year. It's um, making that registration process uh, even easier, um, making uh, the usability um, uh, as enjoyable as possible, um, and giving you that we're putting a massive investment behind those fire APIs. Uh, so they're complete and reliable and robust and can integrate into your healthcare economy.